the Shape Our Water series is put on by Seattle Public Utilities. This is the first of three fireside chats and I am one of the design team members and I'm hosting tonight's event, but you'll get to see a number of us as this process continues. We are so glad that you are here. And just to ground us for a second, I will say the big question for tonight's series is how has your relationship with water shifted throughout time? So you is you out there in the audience, us as part of the team, the panelists you're gonna hear from today, that's sort of what we all hope to keep on our minds. Um, as we began thinking about what we wanted to talk about for these, this series, one of our design team members told us about the word for water in his culture and the fact that the translation meant um, water is life. And I think we were all inspired by that. And that's led us to um, framing up and thinking about tonight's series, really giving space for indigenous voices, um, important local Seattle voices to think about this big question about shifting our relationship with water over time. And that member, Matt Ramel, is not able to join us tonight, but he was integral in thinking about this. So we would just um, say thank you for his work on this and um, we're sending him the best of wishes. So with that, I'm sure you would all love a little bit of context about what this series is about, what this whole project is about, and why we're here tonight. So to do that, we're really fortunate to have um, some remarks from Mami Hara. Um, Mami is the general manager for Seattle Public Utilities. And of note, her work is centered on advancing an equitable and sustainable Seattle and region through collaboration and investments in community. Um, she brings over three decades of experience in sustainable land and water management practices and advances them through cultivating leaders, partnerships, and participation. So all of her work and her background is the perfect setup for tonight. Um, and we will show you a recorded video, which will give you a little bit of that table setting and launch us into the series. So I believe with that, um, we will watch a video from her. Hello, welcome fellow Seattleites. Everyone in our city relies on a vast, invisible wastewater and drainage system that helps keep our waterways clean and prevents our streets from flooding. But the potential benefits of this infrastructure go far beyond healthy waters and safe streets. Seattle Public Utilities is embarking on a different way to plan for the future of these infrastructure investments. Shape Our Water is a 50-year plan for Seattle's water resilience with an emphasis on stormwater and wastewater. This planning effort is different because we are striving to create a truly shared vision with our communities and stakeholders. We recognize our communities are the best skill to help us look beyond pipes and green infrastructure to see their broader role in people's lives, like safer neighborhoods and healthy and engaging public spaces. In this collaborative process, we aim to be clear and transparent about our responsibilities and commitments in the hopes of laying the foundation for trust and collaboration toward meaningful and equitable solutions. Seattle Public Utilities is responsible for providing drainage and wastewater services for the city of Seattle, which means we are stewards of publicly owned infrastructure systems that have taken over a century to build. It's our duty to manage these systems efficiently and sustainably to protect public health, safety, and the environment. This commitment remains the same as we face the escalating challenges of the 21st century, from managing and reducing water pollution and providing excellent service to our ever-growing population, to combating climate change impacts and preparing for an earthquake, we must see these challenges as opportunities. We can continue our commitment as stewards of public and environmental health while making smart investments to build infrastructure that can do more for all Seattleites. We believe infrastructure has the power to provide multiple benefits to our residents. Infrastructure like floodable open space that can help our system from overflowing while also acting as a gathering space. Infrastructure along roadways that can reduce flooding and bring nature back into our urban fabric. Infrastructure is the platform upon which our society and culture are built. How, what, and where we build and whom we build for speaks volumes about who we are and what we value. It is our responsibility to manifest your values in all that we do, and this conversation and planning effort are fundamental to doing that. 
We're inviting you and everyone in Seattle to join us on this journey and to plan with us. This process is a three-year effort where we will gather and share information in various ways and try new strategies to co-create with you. It is important for us to lead with a collaborative process to determine how to invest in programs, projects, and partnerships that achieve the greatest environmental and community benefits for Seattle at the lowest possible cost to our customers. Tonight kicks off that collaborative effort with our Fireside series, where we can ground ourselves in our water history to better understand solutions for the future. We are so grateful to have the time to hear from and learn from our local tribal members about their connections to water and the true value our local water bodies hold. Next month, you can also participate in two more conversations, one highlighting the importance of embedding equity in planning processes, and the other exploring examples of how other cities are tackling future challenges. Many thanks go to our design team of community leaders who have brought great energy and expertise to build out a series that is inviting, informative, and responds to the current ways we're able to gather. Please visit shapeourwater.org, an evolving site where we will hold stories from various community leaders about what our waters mean to them and what they hope for in the future. There are also resources on existing multi-benefit infrastructure that could already be in your backyard and even more activities and ways to participate in the coming months. We hope you continue to learn and design with us as we plan for the next 50 years of equitable and environmentally sound infrastructure investments that shape our water, our most critical resource. Thank you for engaging with us and we hope to see you at future events. Great, thank you. Now that we've made it through that introduction, which really tells us why we're here for the evening, I'm going to be that MC that gives you a few more reminders on the housekeeping bit, um, just to keep that on our minds. And I will repeat a few things for us throughout the night so we're all keeping track. So you'll notice that you're on mute when you enter um, into this session, and that's just to give space for the panelists. But you are the most important part of tonight as alongside our panelists. And so the chat function is open and available to you throughout the entire evening. Please leave thoughts, comments. If you agree with something, disagree, let us know. Um, we won't be ans answering or taking questions from the audience as we move through the panel, but we will save some time at the end to think about that. And just know that if we don't get a chance to talk about your question out loud. We see it, we are recognizing it. We will either resurface that question um, in a future session or it will somehow inform the process as we move along. So any feedback that you have to offer is great. Um, I'm also gonna ask you at some point to answer one of the questions that we're asking our panelists to think about. And that's just a chance to really make sure that your voice and your ideas are a part of this evening. Um, so what I'll do is I'll introduce the panel to you, this panel we keep talking about, and then I'll get, leave some space for Ken to do a general welcome. You'll notice that we did not do a land acknowledgement, which we would normally do in these events, and that's because we have a more authentic opportunity with Ken. And then from there, he will give his own um, sort of thoughts for about 10 minutes, and then Rachel, Stephanie, and Justice, who you will meet shortly, will do the same, and from there we'll move into the panel. So with that, let me just give you a little bit about them in their bios. So first we have Ken Workman. Um, he is a member of the Duwamish tribe, the first people of Seattle, and the fourth generation great-grandson of Chief Seattle. A retired systems and data analyst from the Boeing Company, Ken is a former president of Duwamish Tribal Services and a formal tribal council member. He is a board member of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and member of DRCC, which is Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. After Ken's welcome and his speech, we will hear from Rachel Heaton. Rachel is a cultural educator for the Muckleshoot Tribe in the Cultural Resources Department, working to learn, build, and sustain their cultural practices. She is also the co-founder of the indigenous-led divestment organization, Mazaka Talks. Stephanie Masterman is the retail manager for Seattle's first ever native-owned cultural art flagship store, Eighth Generation. Located within the heart of Seattle at Pike Place Market. 
She has served in several leadership roles for her tribe. Stephanie is also a member of the Burke Museum's first cohort of the Indigenous Research family. And last but certainly not least, we have Justice Bill, um, a cultural research intern with the Muckleshoot Culture Division, an enrolled member of the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe, um, and the people of Southeast Alaska. Justice recently graduated with his AA from Seattle Central College and is now a student at the University of California, Berkeley, where he is majoring in Native American Studies. Justice has been participating in his Native cultural traditions since he was young through the Alaska Kutia dancers and the Muckleshoot Canoe family. More recently, he has been studying Muckleshoot history under the tutelage of Elder Gilbert Hoagie and Talis King George. So with that, I will hand the mic over to you, Ken. Ah, thank you. There, that works better. <laughs> Well, yes, the CIA, yes, that's good to see you on the Halasta Baslak Hill. And this just means, hello, my friends, it's good to see you on this uh, TV screen thing here today. And so if you hear me speaking in Lachute Seed in English, they kind of waffle in and out depending on whatever my brain happens to be thinking at the time. And so this, these are the words in Lachute Seed that we were uh, not allowed to speak for so very long. And so now they're starting to come back and it's such a thrill to see all the young people pick up these words and this language and they just talk. <laughs> and so it's an honor for me to be here today. Uh, just as my grandfather stood on the shores of Alki in 1851, barely two grandmas ago, only 170 years ago. And he said, um, uh, Come ashore, my friends. Come ashore, my friends, onto this land of the ancient Duwamish. And this word gui means uh, welcome. But we as a people recognize that the world is very small these days. And so now we say, And and that just simply means we welcome everybody onto this land of the Duwamish today. And so it's important to recognize that there are many people, many native people in Seattle. And so we try to say thank you as, in as many ways as we can. And so we say Gunal Chish because Gunal Chish is this uh, Tlingit word, the Tlingit people of the southernmost end of Alaska. It's a word for thank you. And so we thank our Tlingit friends for being here in Seattle. They're Haida neighbors to the south a couple hundred miles, they use Hawa. And the neighbors of the Haida, the Simsian, they use Deutschkam. And all of these words mean the same thing and we're beginning to talk once again. Further south on the western shores of Vancouver Island, you run into the new Chinalt where they use Tleiko. And their cousins, the Makah, they use Tleiko as well. Heiske is the word for the Saanich and the Lummi up on the U.S. Canadian border on the Wolch. Um, Wolch is um, what people call Salish Sea today. Just to the north of us, we have our friends, the Tulalips, and uh, we say Tig, because this is their word for saying thank you, Tigweed Seed. So if you hear that, you know the Tulalips are talking to you right here in Seattle. The Snow uh, Suquamish, the Duwamish, the Snoqualmie, the Muckleshoot, the Puyallups, the Stilicum, Quidid is the word that we use. Further south, you run into the Chehalis and the Cowlitz and the Chinook, where they use uh, Chinook jargon. So that would be um, Hayo, Hayo Masi, big thanks. And if you're traveling east, you run into the Lakotas, make sure you say, Hello to our friend Matt Remley. And so we say, Well, Pila Tonka to Siaya to Dagahik Oyayu Sas Seattle Aslak Hill. And this simply saying to my friend Matt, thank you, Matt, for all the work that you do here in Seattle. If you end up in Quebec, use Migwich. And those people over on the East Coast will recognize you and they will say, Oh, these people are learning our language. And so we say these words in as many languages as we can. 
so that we can say here today to our friends, Flalio de Siaya de Shapada de Lok Lok Duams. Come ashore, my friends, onto this ancient land of the Duamish, Gui de Siaya. You are welcome here. Thank you. I'm turning my video on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So, um, again, I just want to um, thank. Uh, Seattle Public Utilities uh, for being a part of this first um, fireside series. And it's an honor to, to be on here with each one of uh, the speakers and, and for everyone that's joining. Um, so, um, and, and are we covering our questions or are we just in giving introductory thoughts at this moment? Giselle? If you feel like you want to drop in a little bit for the questions feel free to but it's really just your introductory thoughts and how you've been thinking about being a water steward okay um so um again thank you everybody who who's um here and and i'm thankful to be a part of this um i know uh for myself uh when we talk about the importance of water um it automatically uh for me goes to um just the the work that we that, that we are doing as stewards when we talk about um, a number of us that are on here that were out at Standing Rock. And um, a lot of people not hearing the phrase of um, water is life. And so getting to talk about that and how it's related to our tribal communities, I think is super important. And with the questions that we're answering today, um, I think it gives us an opportunity to kind of talk about um, um, more of the vulnerable populations that aren't always a part of these conversations. So um, I think it's it's great to be on here to get um, a verse uh, conversation with people involved in different areas. Um, I know mine started with um, standing on the the front lines um, out at, at Standing Rock, and and that's where I would say that the relationship with water had changed and shifted for me, versus um, water just being um, um something that we all um what's the best way i want to put it something that i think we all take for granted in a lot of ways is something that's always here um something that i know that we have access to but not really understanding the importance and so um i know when we discuss our questions today i'm going to go ahead and um kind of touch on those relationships um these waterways are my ancestors um, traveling highways. And so when we talk about infrastructure and projects, they all have um, an impact on our communities. And so I think firsthand um, having these conversations today is allowing us to, um, to touch on that. And so again, um, it's great to have everyone here. It's great to you know, be touching on um, land acknowledgement and, and the people of um, our First Nations here, uh, here in what um, in Seattle. So um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and let you guys get started and then uh, we'll be back. <laughs> That's perfect. Stephanie, if you would love to take a minute to give us your introductory remarks. Hello, can you all hear me? All right. Yeah, we can. Yay, okay. It was giving me the, you're not allowed to unmute. <laughs> Um, well, hello everyone. My name is Stephanie Masterman. I am Shingit. My family is from Huna and Juneau, Alaska. I was born and raised here in Washington, um, mostly growing up in Muckleshoot and going to school in Auburn. Um, I'm currently a student at the University of Washington, where I'm working toward my bachelor's degree in American Indian Studies, as well as Arctic Studies. Um, as you heard before, I am the Retail and Special Projects Manager at Eighth Generation, which is Seattle's first ever Native-owned cultural arts and wool blanket company. Our store is at the Pike Place Market and Eighth Generation is owned by the Snoqualmie Tribe. I'm happy to participate in this panel today um, with our other guest speakers, some of whom I am close enough with to call family. Um, I spent at least the last five years um, engaging in community activism with these folks and it means a lot for me to be joining them um, as a speaker today. I'd like to 
acknowledge again for myself um, that we are here on Duwamish territory. And the matters that we speak of tonight are not just restricted to the jurisdictions and the boundaries of the cities, the counties, the tribes, and the state. Um, to remind us all that water connects all of us um, from the mountains to the sound and to the ocean. We are all connected by the waterways. Um, we are speaking on matters that impact all people in the city, but we cannot forget that our neighbors just outside our city boundaries are greatly impacted by the decisions that we make here in the city. Um, so I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, water is life and where that comes from. Um, so Rachel mentioned a bit earlier about Standing Rock and um, that phrase water is life um, became a trend based off of the Lakota saying mani wichoni. Um, water is life is an easy catch phrase but so much is lost in translation. And like Ken was saying, we all have our, our different ways, our languages where we can say thank you. Uh, what it really means is this could not happen without you. So it's e even more than a thank you. Um, it's even more than water is life. Um, uh, water is not, just a resource for us. Um, and I wanna say that indigenous efforts to protect the land and waterways are also efforts to protect our identities and our responsibilities to care for the land and the water. It's who we are. And that's why the waterways, you know, from here and all the way across the nation are, are named after indigenous peoples. I'm looking forward to a plan shaped for water resiliency that, and that is having clean water and having access to that clean water for all people. And that's gonna mean a lot of hard work on behalf of the city. It's vital for the city to take the necessary time, which could be a long time, the necessary resources, which could be a lot of resources. Um, to ensure that the local indigenous ecological knowledge is a part of these plans and that it is respected. It's vital for the city to uphold its obligation to the treaties and the local tribes, um, and especially the leadership and the knowledge of the Duwamish people for whose territory we are all on. Um, I want to just remind remind us all um, that we all have an obligation to our, our neighbors, um, the citizens of the city, um, but in this work there is that big obligation to the tribes. Um, I really emphasize this because I recognize that I, um, to even speak with you tonight, am a guest on this land. Um, my people are from Southeast Alaska uh, these lands and waterways are different from my homelands, um, but my responsibility to care for them and nurture them and go about them in a good way uh, remains the same. Um, the ties to the land are intrinsic to all people really. Uh, and it's very important that we just recognize that no one, no scientist, no politician, no activists knows these lands better than the Coast Salish peoples. Um, I want to say again that water is not just a resource. It is medicine. It sustains us. It's who we go to for our healing. It gives us strength. It challenges us and it is bigger than us. We have been asked here to share our cultural ties to the land and to the water and for me, again, I emphasize this, um, that cultural tie, that spiritual bond to the land and to the water does not exclude our responsibility to the land and to the water. So thank you so much for creating a space like this. Thank you for having us here. Um, and I really look forward to the work and um, the commitment 
that happens because of these fireside conversations in early planning and building a strong foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I think we all sort of hear this little statistics about be, humans being made up of 60% water and it moves up still for brain, heart, lungs, but when, when you have framed it as our identity, I think it hits in a different way. And I think it then sort of gets us thinking about uh, the cultural ties that you all are bringing and speaking to tonight and why it's ever more important than just those little factoids. Um, I think we will have Justice do his um, introductory remarks. And I also just wanted to say for the entire audience that in reading Justice's bio, I did not read all of the identities that um, he provided for us. So I just wanted to say, please feel free to share that. Any identity that's important to you is important to all of us. Um, and I just want to give space to that as well. Justice Bill um, good evening, everyone. My name is Justice Bill. I'm an enrolled member of the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe, and I'm also going to introduce myself in Klinkit. Gonna cheese, yethna chatati, kikla or gonna cheese kikla ishu chat du esak yethna chatati dakten tan chatati hana kau ay chat. So as I said, my name is Justice Bill. I'm an enrolled member of the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe uh, at Muckleshoot. Uh, our UNA or our usual and accustomed area uh, encompasses the city of Seattle. And so these discussions are very important to our people. Um, we still exercise our treaty rights at the end of every summer and in early fall, you can see our fishermen out um, on Duwamish River and out into Elliott Bay, um, practicing these rights and um, earning a living for their families. And so the waters of Seattle have always been important to our people. And I look forward to sharing um, more of our history throughout the evening with you guys. And once again, just another thank you to Seattle Public Utilities for reaching out and having uh, me come on tonight. It's my uh, first time like in a public speaking setting for a while. So um, I was kind of joking before this, the actual presentation started, like Ken has a trophy in the background. Rachel has re weaving supplies. Um, Stephanie's room's like color coordinated and then I have Star Wars posters in the background. So I feel a little unprepared, but yeah, other than that, I'm looking forward to the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, Star Wars deserves some time on screen as well. Um, I wanted to bring resurface that idea that the chat is open for all of you and I'm gonna ask you all in the audience a question. Feel free at any time to sort of give your thoughts, whatever it means to you in the chat. And it's a question that will come up to the entire panel a little bit later in the evening. It's in either or, you can answer both. Um, the question is, what do you hope we stop doing in terms of how we relate to water? Or, and, what do you hope we continue to do in terms of how we relate to water. Um, so I will put that question in the chat if you're a visual person. Um, and of course it will come back up again when I ask the entire uh, panel. So feel free to use the chat and chime in and share your thoughts as we're moving through this. Um, and don't feel that you need to be as eloquent as our panelists have been. Any thought you have is great. So we'll move a little bit away from the more free form, having our panelists share their remarks and general thoughts about water into a series of questions um, in the spirit of giving everybody some time and um, sort of to Matt's idea of really thinking about it intergenerational, intergenerational and cross-cultural and um, elder youth kind of vibe of this chat, um, I will call on one of our panelists first for each of the questions so everybody has a chance to sort of take a first stab. So the first question is, what are important lessons about water that you will pass down to your descendants? And Rachel, if you want to start us off and then everybody else can popcorn in as an idea comes to you. And I'll say the question one more time if it's helpful. What are important lessons about water that you will pass down to your descendants? So um, I think one thing that um, 
it's really important to understand as, as native people of Turtle Island and other indigenous people around the world, our teachings began with Mother Earth and therefore um, the respect of water is, is number one at, you know, as, a, as a part of that. And so um, I truly believe that um, we understood the relationship with water. Um, water gives life, it sustains life, it can take life. Um, water is a powerful being. Um, we view it as a spiritual being. It's not something that's separated from us. It's a part of us. It's um, who we are. Um, and so water is a powerful being. When, um, it's Like we said, it's used to give life. It's part of our ceremonies. And we understand that we cannot live without water. So how do we apply these practices you know, to our decision making? Um, when we're talking about infrastructure is understanding the relationship. Um, I think it's, I, I think a lot of the world, when we think about um, corporations, when we think about everyday life, when we talk about taking things for granted, I think water is viewed as a commodity. And for some, it's viewed as a way to privatize. Um, and instead of, we should be looking at water as a human right. And so when we're talking about um, that relationship is how do we how do we teach our future generations um, that that importance? And so again, for those of us that were out at Standing Rock, we saw this firsthand. Um, that fight was about water is for life. And again, it's about the lack of care from the fossil fuel industry um, and other corporations. And I think when we talk about infrastructure, a lot of times um, it goes in in a lot of ways um, that these kind of projects takes place. And so um, by having our most vulnerable populations in these conversations, I think that's something that we should always be thinking about is um, looking to those that are impacted the most by our decisions. And um, our communities are, are those um, most impacted, but also um, our um, black and, and uh, black indigenous and, and people of color communities. And so um, I think when we start having those conversations um, with those that are the most impacted, I think that's when we start making the biggest changes. So for me, um, I think creating those relationships um, uh, from the top down and, and including those that are the most vulnerable. So, so if we're talking about our future generations, um, I would tell them that these conversations don't have a, happen alone. They don't just happen with politicians. They don't just happen um, in decision-making uh, areas that um, we actually have to start making our communities a part of these conversations and bringing them to the table. So I would continue to share that, that message. And I see you're off mute. Does that mean you're ready to jump in? <laughs> sure. <clears throat> um, the important lessons that I would pass on would be the same lesson that Chief Seattle was talking about in 1855 uh, when he signed the Point Elliot Treaty. And he's just getting ready to sign this treaty. And he makes this speech about how um, the people are connected to the land and to the soil. And all of this is scientifically provable. But he was saying um, to this Isaac Stevens that these strangers, these white people abandoned their dead, but they're not entirely dead. And that, um, that they simply change form. And he says a lot of other things as well. But if you consider that as native people, we've been living on these hills for uh, thousands and thousands of years and dying for thousands and thousands of years. And we have these places called Kayo Ali, these graveyards. So we would take our people that would pass to these places, their soft tissue would decay and go back down into the ground. And everybody knows out here in the Northwest, when the winter time comes, all the sap runs out of the trees. And then when the spring rains come, all that stuff that's in the ground, which includes all that was grandma and grandpas and aunties and uncles gets sucked back up through the roots of the trees through the symbiotic relationship between uh, mycorrhiza fungi attached to the roots of the trees. And so grandma and grandpa are actually in the trees. So when we're talking water is life, it's this transport at a molecular level of all of our relatives back into the tree. So it is literal. It's not a figure of speech when we're talking about this kind of stuff. And so that's what I would pass along 
that we are as a people connected to the land and we have been for thousands and thousands of years. And so I would ask um, this project, take better care of the stormwater. <laughs> Let's clean it up. We're trying to save the killer whale too. We're trying to save the salmon. That's who we are. We recognize that we're everywhere. So that's the lesson that I'm passing along. Thank you so much, Stephanie or Justice. Do you wanna tell us what you would pass along? Um, well, I don't have any descendants and hopefully I won't for a couple more years, but um, anyways, uh, you know, I think um, both of my elders uh, put it pretty succinctly, you know, on the respect that we should have for our water. And as a student of our history, um, I want to share the direct relationship that we had with these waterways. Um, you know, prior to contact, um, water really was the center of our being. We used it um, all of our villages were located next to the rivers and the lakes and on the Salish Sea. And during the summer, um, we would use those to travel to gather different types of food and to meet with relatives, uh, to get married. And um, one of the favorite stories that I found and one that I'm sure that I'll pass on to my descendants is that um, every summer, my ancestors from the village of Stuck and um, which is at uh, Van Doren's uh, landing in Kent, kind of, uh, like Kent, Des Moines. And um, in the villages of Lake Washington, they'd travel by canoe or by foot um, to a point called, uh, today that's known as Three Tree Point, traditionally it was known as Scalab, and the beach south of it. And they'd gather there, they'd harvest clams, they'd fish, they'd hunt for marine animals like porpoise and seal. And um, that, that beach was, uh, known as Indian's playground. And I think, you know, water is, um, it's a source of bringing us all together as native people. And it's also a source of joy. It's where we could gather and um, make re relationships and um, provide for our winters, you know? And um, yeah, I think that's one story that I'll definitely pass down. Great, and Stephanie? Yeah, um, well, Rachel and Ken did a really, they stole what I was gonna say. No, um, I just wanna reiterate a little bit of what they said. Um, and like the first thing that comes to mind is definitely stop commoditizing and privatizing water. Um, if we acknowledge um, the long-term pathway, uh, the downstream of life when water changes its its forms. Um, it's in us and then we become the land and now it's in the land and then it, it becomes part of the storm and drainage and wastewater and then it goes back into the ocean and now the, the killer whales and the salmon are impacted by that water. You know, it is um, this circle. And I think that you, you pose a huge barrier to that that circle or that cycle by commoditizing and privatizing access to water and water itself. Um, so that's a huge issue. That's definitely something we need to stop doing. Um, and, and one thing that we should be doing and one thing that I of course plan to pass on um, to you know, my future children and grandchildren um, is that we should be treating water with fragility um, and treat water as like this precious uh, piece of life it, it, that gives us everything because it does. Um, I saw in the comments some folks said to not uh, think of water as the, the wastewater as just like dirty and um, toxic um, because it's still water. And in a way that's kind of analogy for how people are too. Um, in the same ways that we treat each other, the same ways that we treat the land, the same ways that we treat the water. Um, and so there's like a huge part of um, just treating water 
with the uh, with the respect and um, preciousness and fragility that it deserves um, is a really big deal to me on a personal level. Um, and Justice talks about the the sites, the villages, um, the you know the beaches. Rachel touched on. Um, the, the waterways and the trails and, you know, the way that um, Coast Salish people moved and still move on this land. And I think that what's really important is that um, we, we continue to make space for things like that to happen. Um, I was talking about this earlier with a mentor um, just that the teachings that I have, I'm 25 years old, the teachings that I have, well, it took me all 25 years to even have this understanding. Um, and so it will take a lifetime for the next generations to also um, have this understanding and value and respect for the water. Um, on a large scale, uh, I plan, all right, reverse. <laughs> so I plan to, of course, dedicate myself to passing on those teachings that have taken me my whole life and will continue to grow. Um, and that's for me and my family. Uh, to re I want to recognize that a lot of that is um, oral tradition. And with the mentor I was speaking with today from Snoqualmie tribe, she was saying um, to remember that uh, Northwest Coast people are people of oral traditions. And so some of the things we can actually share with you, some of the things we won't, we can't and we won't share with you because you will have to learn those things just like we do. Um, and so just to be observant and just go with respect. And on a large scale, I think what the city can do to pass on or leave a legacy for the the culture and the society being created by the work that you're doing um, is to again set a strong foundation for how to do things right um, and that means doing the hardest of the hard work doing the dirtiest of the dirty work um, because that's what it's going to take and Maybe that means the, the, the water resiliency plan turns into a hundred year plan because it will take the first 50 years to make it right um, and uphold that traditional ecological knowledge and values of the Coast Salish people here. Um, but that is a legacy that you can pass on, right? If it takes a hundred years, 50 years longer to do it the right way, that is a legacy that we as a society and as a city can do. Um, and I'm gonna stop there because I think I'm rambling. No, you're definitely not rambling. You're making great points. I think important points for all of us, even though a hundred years maybe sounds scary and long. <laughs> Um, I think we can hop around a little bit and go to the next question, which is going to be, what does being a water steward mean to you? Um, and for the audience, you can continue to answer that question that I popped into the chat. I believe Erica from Makers has popped it into the chat, but you could also start to just populate with questions you would like the panel to think about when we get to Q&A or as we continue to engage. So for the panel, I'll say again, the question is, what does being a water steward mean to you? And maybe Ken, we could have you start that one. Um, really what I consider us as our stewards of the land and by extension, the streets and the sidewalks and how we treat the water that falls out of the sky. It runs across the asphalt, runs across um, catch basins. And then um, sometimes when there's big storms out here, some of that untreated water ends up out in, out in Elliott Bay, out in Puget Sound. And so we know that the nitrogen levels are at dangerously high levels when that happens. And we just had a storm recently where 11 million gallons of untreated water was flushed out because uh, the West Point 
system couldn't handle it all. 20% of that was just raw sewage. So we need to become better stewards on how we handle the resources that we have. And we're beginning to do that. We're beginning to do it through infrastructure design. And so from my perspective as a cultural person, it would be take better care of the land. And by extension, you will take better care of the earth. And so when people ask me, well, Ken, what are you doing this for? I tell them I'm trying to save the planet one blade of grass at a time. And so that's what being a water steward to me means respect the water. There's people all around the world who do not have potable water like we do. And if you need an example of that, just fly around some of these places and say, can I have a glass of water and take it out of the tap? They don't drink water out of a tap. And yet we have it right here in the Pacific Northwest. So I would ask, understand what H2O is, where it comes from, what it means to you. That as a human being, if you go three days without water, well, you're going to be kaput. So, so just be a better steward, uh, better infrastructure design, design for the long term. Uh, take care of the, the earth. The seven hills of Seattle really haven't changed that much. And all the old bones are still in the ground. And they all, all that nutrient material that was the ancient ones still migrate up into the grass and the berries and the roots and the trees. So that's what it means to me. That's a great note. And uh, just in case some of you don't remember back to elementary school, I know I didn't before this chat, um, of all of the water available on earth, 0.3% is accessible um, to humans. So I think that point you make about who has access to potable water and sort of who can use it, uh, and when you start to put it into that sort of scale, it's much more profound. Um, Justice, do you want to tackle the question next? What does being a water steward mean to you? Yeah, I can um, do that. I think um, on a personal level, being a water steward just means uh, reaffirming and um, my relationship with water. And, you know, I, um, I remember when No Dapple was happening and, you know, Rachel was there and I, I was at school at the time and um, I desperately wanted to just, you know, leave my studies behind and you, uh, go help out. And um, I didn't, but I think for me, like, um, just being, like, being cognizant of how water affects my life. And it's become especially apparent to me how important it is in um, the context of COVID-19. Um, because since I was, like, four or five years old, I've been going on two new journeys. And so last year is the first year that I wasn't really able to participate in journeys um, because of the coronavirus. And um, it, it's something for me, at least, that's deeply spiritual and affected me um, to not be able to go out on our canoes and travel from village to village and to see my relatives from other places. And, um, and not having that has really solidified for me the importance of maintaining our waterways, right? Because without them, a huge part of my myself and my identity um, is gone. And, um, you know, with the sewage spills, I think the past two years that we've pulled, either leaving from Alki or from Suquamish, there's been a sewage spill. And I remember in 2019 on the paddle to Lemmy, we were leaving Suquamish on the way to Tulalip. And Rachel is right behind me on the canoe. And um, that, like we had just gotten news about the sewage spill that morning. And so she, she kept talking about it and I was getting grossed out. So I just bust into song every time she mentioned it because I don't want to think about the water. Um, but yeah, it's it's brutal. We One of our pollers, um, he just had a small cut on his leg and it ended up getting infected by that water. And um, yeah, it was bad. bad. But yeah, I, I think um, besides any of the outside work, which there's there's tons of work to be done and um, I'm not quite sure where I'll end up in my career after college, but um, I think above all, just reaffirming my personal relationship with the water is extremely important. Stephanie, do you want to go next? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I can 
just on you know the personal level for me whether it is a steward to the water or to the land like the biggest thing is you know I live in this a little apartment in Seattle um, and the water that I can get to isn't water that I can safely get into all the time. Uh, my dog, I sometimes let him drink the creek water um, and uh, it scares me sometimes, but to think about the fact that the water I can get to from here in the city isn't water that I can get into. It isn't water that is necessarily safe for me. Um, and when I was living in Muckleshoot, um, just the ability to go into, to, to access the water, to access the fresh spring water, to put my body into the water and ground myself um, and recognize how I belong to the water and to the land. Um, just it always reminds you of how important it is to care for it and to uh, to be constantly learning of the the best ways to use and give back to. Um, it's it's the whole thing about reciprocity. Um, when we go to the water, we have offerings for the water, um, and so. For me, kind of like Justice said, it's reaffirming my connection um, and doing everything that I can to uh, connect and like literally put my body in the water and in the land and give back to it um, in every way that I can because what I am taking from it, it may be just, um, it may be intangible, like it may be my healing and it may be that that's just not for that day, like that healing takes me years, uh, but that is something that I am taking. And so I offer something back. Um, and it does sound weird when we talk about it in English. Like again, there's so much of it that's lost in translation. It's hard for us to explain, uh, but the stewardship of the land in the water is really just, um, having respect for the cycle and doing your part in that cycle of reciprocity. And Rachel, do you wanna tell us what being a water steward means to you? Yeah, so um, being a water steward for me is um, also being a, um, a protector of mother earth. And, and recognizing again, that relationship. Um, we can't live without mother earth, but mother earth, um, she can live without us. And I think when we understand that from the most simplest level, um, it allows us to um, continue and, and carry that relationship. But it, it's also about sustaining cultural practices. When we look to the ways that indigenous people and native people here on Turtle Island live, it all goes back to um, protection of our water and, and our mother earth. And so our, our, our first teachings were being stewards. And, and so continuing those relationships by understanding um, and participating in our ceremonies, um, like Stephanie was talking about when, you know, we go to the water and we go in that water, that's a ceremony of, of cleansing and understanding that how that relationship works. Um, I also think being a good water steward is, is a, about empowerment. Um, how do we empower our youth? How do we empower our communities? Um, how do we get involved in legislative decisions um, in that process and having the power to be a voice in that? And, um, but also pushing for community led ventures. So I think being a water steward is going out there and being an educator and creating relationships with um, those that may not understand the true relationship that we should have with water. Um, so I think again, not the pyramid approach from the top down, but truly understanding um, and, and identifying our most vulnerable populations. Because I believe when we truly help our vulnerable populations and we're being those stewards for, um, for, for water, for land, um, we're truly helping everybody. 
because, it, you know, when we look to our future generations, every decision that we make now is empowering their future. So that's another thing that, you know, we're taught us to think seven generations ahead. So being, again, a, a good water steward is educating on those practices of, of like, when we make decisions here in the city of Seattle, how is that going to affect, you know, seven generations from now? And so when we're talking about infrastructure and we're facing a lot of these issues of deteriorating infrastructure and the problems that it's causing and going into drinking water and going into clean waters and, and again, affecting our fish, our animals, um, our most vulnerable populations. Um, I think it truly comes down to being a part of that stewardship um, and that relationship of water and continuing to educate. And so um, education comes in different forms. It comes from, you know, these presentations um, from the individuals who all are giving different aspects. So I think being open-minded and being um, open to um, and, and I want to speak outside of our Native communities. Typically, people aren't necessarily open to hearing um, our practices or our teachings, but really when you get down to the root of it, we're really looking out for everyone. We're taking care of everyone. We're be being stewards of the land is being stewards um, of the water. It's being stewards for um, our future generations. And, and I think the biggest thing is making sure whatever we're doing that we're involving our youth that we're involving them into these projects and these conversations because they are the ones that are gonna be continuing this work. So um, for me, it, it's being an educator and being involved in processes, whether it's political, if it's um, local, if it's um, my community, if it's um, just going up and continuing to practice um, cultural practices and, and being involved in carrying those on because if we stop that now, then who, do, who are we passing that on to? So. Um, so yeah. That's a great answer. Um, one thing that's cool about being the moderator is that you can go rogue. And what's really cool about being moderator on video screen is you can't see anybody shooting uh, crazy looks at you. So I'm gonna do that for a minute. I see um, sort of where we are on time. And a lot of the things that you all brought up in that last round of questions are really important and it's so rare that we get this many people from community in one space at one time with so many um, perspectives we've gone anywhere from 110 to 120 people in this space today so i'm going to ask a question um, for the panel and also for the audience which wasn't planned um, and so anybody can enter that into the chat panelists you can do that when one of your uh, fellow speakers is going um, and then I'll ask one of the general questions that we can move through. So um, if you're in the chat, you can add a question. I saw one from Harper, but I didn't see any others for the group. We might not get to it this evening, but it's important for you to still document it. Um, and then you can answer the question I'm about to ask and for the panelists and the audience, which is um, thinking about this idea of seven generations in the future and um, having the indigenous voice that represents your own community, but also ideas for everyone. And some of the points that Stephanie brought up about um, either not being able to or not um, taking on the responsibility of sharing knowledge beyond tonight as tribal members or as members of Seattle, can you think of a time that you were invited to share your ideas, your traditions, or to set those boundaries with us as practitioners? And if you were invited, um, was it in a way that wasn't a burden to you? And then for the audience, have you ever invited somebody into the conversation about um, their culture, their practices, thinking about generations and community? And did you ask them if how they would like to be invited and if that's a burden to them? So that's my rogue moment. Feel free to use the chat how you want. Um, and then back to regularly scheduled questions for the panel. Um, we're gonna ask you the question that we asked the audience earlier, and that's what do you hope to stop doing in terms of how we relate to water? And what do you hope we continue to do in terms of how we relate to water? Um, Ken, do you want to start? Um, <clears throat> my number one request would be <clears throat> to keep doing would be uh, education. Uh, understand where we are on the planet, where we are as a people, our relationship to the planet, and just just keep learning and learning and learning and then pass on 
as uh, Justice and Rachel, well, Stephanie too, um, your cultural identity, because that identity is connected to the land. And the only way the land can survive is if it rains. <laughs> and, and I never used to like the rain until I broke my neck. That's that trophy back there. <laughs> and so the fact that I could feel the rain on my head was a very big reward. And so uh, appreciate what this thing called H2O is and how we're looking for this water anywhere in the universe. And so um, that's, that's how I feel. I think that I already rambled on to answer the question. Um, I think we are talking about not commodifying the water. Um, mm -hmm. But if I may, I want to answer the, your rogue question. Would that be all right? Please, please do. Yes. Okay, so uh, I, no, I don't think that I, or maybe it, it's just slipped my uh, quarantine mind, which <laughs> is a new way of thinking. Uh, so maybe I just can't remember. Um, but no, I don't really think that there have been spaces where um, I or people I can, I know that I can recall have been invited um, to share knowledge um, within our own boundaries. So this is pretty cool. Um, and the reason why just to say a little more about why there are those boundaries is because in addition to like the commodification of water, um, indigenous peoples and our cultural practices and our spiritual practices and our just um, ways of being and ways of living are appropriated and exploited all the time. And so, so it's hard when you have um, this rich oral history and ecological knowledge and culture and these values and you are hesitant to even share them because so quickly they can be stolen from you um, and used inappropriately. And um, so I think it's really valuable that we have been invited to share and that you asked that question. Um, and so I just wanted to share that a little more, but that's why we have those boundaries and that's why there is some hesitation in, in sharing. Um, but yeah, that's what I got. Thank you for being uh, candid about that. Rachel, would you like to tell us what you hope we stop doing in terms of how we relate to water or what you hope we continue to do? Or you can address the real question, whatever speaking to you. So um, I'm going to speak in terms of what I hope we stop doing. And, and again, that goes back to um, privatizing and, and commodifying uh, water. But um, also recognizing that, that water is not just, I, I think, we live in a country that just allows us to turn the water on. And so we automatically forget that that relationship and how important it is. So um, I think part of that is, um, you know, when we when we talk about water, are we are we effectively communicating with our communities? Are we educating? So I think education is one of the biggest pieces. Um, you know, when you sit in these kind of panels and, and you're hearing information that you haven't heard before, um, take the time to go research and understand why we're saying the things that we're saying instead of being shut off from it just not meeting the ideals that you've grown up with or have heard. Um, but also, um, I think one of the things that I always want to push is sustainability, renewable energy. And so when we talk about um, infrastructure, you know, are we using energy and, and land wisely? Um, are we using natural treatments? Are we building infrastructure that is green and sustainable? And, and so again, I think it goes back to that education piece of just like water isn't just a um, I think we talk about it in a way of, of it's just kind of one of those things that we access versus understanding that there's a true connection to it. And, and that comes from our indigenous teachings. And, and again, when we look at um, all that's taken place over the last 
um, when we look at the industrialization of, of the United States, so much has taken place over the last 50 years and, and how um, such a short amount of time this destruction has happened, you know, how do we continue for the next 50 years um, of, of not continue or, or not it, it, it exasperating that, that um, those issues. So I think um, for me, it's, it's, I hope we stop just thinking of water as something that we turn the faucet on. I hope we think of it as um, it, it's a living being that gives us life that um, if we don't connect to it, our children and our grandchildren and, and so on aren't going to have the ability to do these cultural practices that we talk about. They're not gonna be able to go fish in the waters. They're not even gonna be able to eat the fish in these waters currently. When we think about the number of chemicals and, and sewage and, and things that do go on, that do go into to our waterways. Um, Justice brought up a good point about um, when we were on our canoes last year and for the last two years, there have been raw sewage spills the day our canoes are in the water. So what does that relationship look like to us as native people? It doesn't look like we have a relationship because those waterways are not protected for us to continue our cultural practices. And, and when we reach the further waterways up north and we see these plants um, on the water that are leaking, you know, chemicals and things into our waterways, understanding, you know, the the the, the long-term issues that are, are coming from that. So for me, it's hard to sit on the canoe and, and know that the waters that we're in are not safe. So what are we doing as a city and as communities to further um, um, protect our waters, not just our drinking water, but when we, like we said, um, we think of, of rainwater and stormwater as, as, as dirty water. And the reality is, is we still need that water to sustain the life in our growing cities. And so um, that's the other thing we need to put into um, our thought processes. Are we approaching the, are, are we, how are we approaching the growing demands of our city as more and more people come? And so um, as more and more people come, more pollution, more infrastructure. So again, are we bringing native people? Are we bringing the most vulnerable populations? Are we bringing those individuals to the table? And so um, my biggest thing is like, if you care about our mother earth, you care about our future, or you care about your own future and a future for your future generations and, and even the generations that are here right now, um, get involved, um, whether it's education. For us, you know, standing on the front line at Standing Rock was not about us just being there. It, it's a life or death situation when we understand the relationship of water really is life. And if we do not protect that life, then, th then we do not have a future. So um, education, I think, is, is probably the number one thing and being open-minded to new education, so. Excellent points. Something that's been on my mind recently is um, when we talk about COVID and the current pandemic, we talk about this as if it's the first public health crisis. And um, that is because it's in the viewpoint of a certain group of people. And I think when we think a little bit about what you all have said today, um, about your canoe journeys, about water as your identity, about um, water that you can't actually use and who can turn on their tap, it uh, reminds us that public health if we actually think about everybody in their relationship to water and the environment um, has been a long-standing thing and um, I just think that that's important to hear. Ken do you want to tell us, uh, uh, I'm sorry actually Justice, do you want to tell us what um, you hope we continue doing or stop doing? Yeah, I mean, my my views are essentially the same in terms of that we need to stop um, commodifying water. I know that uh, water is actually like public on the stock market or is set to go public, which is kind of insane to me. Um, and I like to be completely candid, I thought I kind of um, got mixed up on the format tonight. So I had like a whole like presentation ready. But um, besides that, like, I wanted, I did want to talk a little bit about the um, like historic transgressions made against our water rights, because I think that's a history that's like very limited and um, to just briefly like go into it. So um, when our treaties were signed, especially the Treaty of Medicine Creek, um, a lot of the reservation um, land that was set aside for us was um, like essentially inhabitable. Inhabitable. Um, 
so at Nisqually, their reservation had didn't even have a source of fresh running water. There wasn't even a creek or a stream for them to drink out of or bathe out of, and uh, much less fish out of, which was essential to our livelihood. There is no way for them to adapt to you know the agricultural lifestyle that the federal government wanted us to do. And um, at Muckleshoot, you know, we didn't even have a reservation, but we um, both at Muckleshoot and at Puyallup and at Nisqually, you know, we banded together and we actually engaged in warfare with both the United States military and um, Governor Isaac Stevens had his own private militia. And um, in the white history books, you'll see that not much was accomplished by both sides in that war, but what was secured and what we consider is a victory is that we maintained a land base. Um, Nisqually received an improved reservation and at Muckleshoot, we retained a land base for our people um, from the Stuck River, um, which runs from Sumner to Puyallup, all the way up to the villages um, throughout Seattle. Um, and we had access to water on both sides of our reservation on the Green River and the White River. And but then in 1906, there's court battles between Pierce County and King County. And um, I, I can't remember who won those court battles, but essentially it diverted the rivers. So the White River traditionally ran into what was the Duwamish. And um, because of the diversion, it now went into the Stuck River Channel, which eventually meets with the Puyallup. And the Green River now flows where the White River used to, uh, although on a slightly changed course um, into the White into the Duwamish River. And um, this had a drastic effect on their livelihood. And one of the reasons they did this was to prevent um, flooding of the valleys that people were now inhabiting because when it rains, the Green River and the White River would flood the valleys out so people couldn't live there. That's why uh, you know, we built our, our villages on hills because we understood how floods work. Um, and then to like further make things worse for us, they built the Mud Mountain Dam in the 1940s. And as a result of that, I think we lost 40,000 salmon um, who were returning to spawn. And that was a big hit and our salmon runs really haven't recovered since then. Um, and of course, you know, there's the whole fishing uh, rights and uh, what we call the second treaty war struggle, which is definitely a conversation for another time, but it ties into water rights, right? Our ability to uh, use the waters within our usual and accustomed areas um, to provide a livelihood for our people. And so I think um, to go along with commodification, I think there definitely needs to be, I don't know how to put this, but maybe you could say like ecological reparations or something along that lines, right? To where the past wrongdoings against our people and against our water are undone. And we've seen that in instances such as the Elwha River where, where they removed the Elwha River Dam and salmon returns have improved drastically. Um, and I don't know if we could, I mean, logistically, right? I don't think we could take down the Mud Mountain Dam because then 100,000 people are homeless at the time. But, you know, it's something to look towards in terms of how we um, plan for the future in terms of water usage and how um, we don't use water as a tool for ourselves, but rather um, we respect the water and take care of it. And then in turn, it will take care of us, right? Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. Thank you so much. Um, ooh, surprise, just all's going rogue again. So um, I'm looking again at the time. So we have about 10 minutes. And I think what I wanna do instead of closing this out with me doing a bunch of talking, I will just um, to everyone who's here say thank you so much for coming, for participating, sharing your thoughts. You still have time to chime in. Um, Justice, it's cute that you thought you were gonna mention that you had a presentation and that I wasn't gonna daylight that. Um, I definitely am. So everybody can go around, say sort of what's on your mind that you wanna make sure now that you have a platform, let us know like the last thing you wanna say. Um, and then we'll end with you, Justice, and you can share whatever you'd like to close us out for the night. You can keep it short, give us as much as you want, no pressure. So um, Rachel, if you wanna give us your closing ideas and we can just move around the group. Okay. Um, well, I think just one thing I, I just want to finish up saying again is thank you to everybody who took the time to come on here and, and listen, you know, to us and um, 
the teachings that we know and our practices and how important and relevant it is to the work that City of Seattle is doing. And um, again, I just need to thank um, Seattle Public Utilities for um, opening this conversation beyond just um, the decision makers and, and the people um, you know, that are ultimately not affected by, by the decisions. So um, for me, it, it's, um, I, I hope that our, our decision-making bodies, when, um, that we look to equity, you know, that we look to equality in, in these decisions, um, that when we're creating oversight boards and commissions, that we're actually involving um, our most vulnerable populations, the people who are affected by these decisions. Um, I So many times we see people with money and people with decision-making power making decisions for, for situations that they can't comprehend. And so um, I, I think um, keeping that in mind, um, the equality and asking the questions as, as a business, you know, um, am I truly being fair to, to my community? Am I truly nourishing, you know, the, the mission and, and the values that um, we're trying to um, reiterate? And so, um, again, biggest thing I could ask is educate yourself, be open to the education that you get from our Indigenous communities. Um, we are stewards of this land, the original, you know, people of these lands. And so our practices and, and knowledge and teachings are based on that and sustaining it. So um, I think education is always uh, going to be a key piece. So always be open to that. And thank you again for um, allowing uh, my voice on here tonight. We're lucky to have you. Stephanie, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I guess <laughs> you asked a question about what not to do, and now I'm remembering. <laughs> <laughs> um, another piece that I didn't really get to touch on, but um, there are a lot of times that Indigenous peoples have been gravely harmed by well-intended um, people, well-intended politicians, well-intended environmentalists and organizations. Um, and I think that, you know, COVID-19 has shown us that what we're capable of, what we can stop dead in its tracks when it's causing harm um, and what we can do with the quickness to provide safety and security for people. Um, and so I just think that, we should just be very, very careful um, in how decisions are being made um, because there a lot of harm can be done um, if things are not seen fully through. Um, if, you know, in the case of water, if um, tribes and um, the vulnerable populations are not um, consulted with and not even just consulted with like we have solutions um we've been fighting to be heard since forever um and so the solutions are not really hard to find um it's a matter of just taking down the barriers um and i just think that like just for education in terms of um what the unintended what's the word what are the unintended harm could be you know like if you keep uh macaw people from whaling you're essentially destroying their livelihood and culture and um, chance at a future for their people and their way of life and how many good people and well-intended people thought that was a good idea um it, it, it was not a good idea. Um, and the same goes with any indigenous group um, really around the world and in this country. Um, so just, I think the education, but specifically in like the long hard research of um, does the solution that my organization have have unintended consequences that are gravely harmful to indigenous people and do not gloss over the consultation part. Um, and I don't know how to say that better, but I think I just stress that that's something I really, really care about. So thank you. I don't think you needed to say it better, you nailed it. Um, Ken, do you have any closing thoughts or 
comments that you want to share with us? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank the panel and thank everybody for um, coming here tonight. Um, the Duwamish people, uh, do means insight and mish means people. So we call ourselves Duwabs, where Abj is people. And so I'd like to recognize uh, Justice and Rachel as people of the Black River, the uh, Hitach Stolak Abj, Yafhacho Abs that uh, we recognize you and that we see you and we thank you. We know you're um, sitting over there on Muckleshoot right now, but maybe someday we can have a reservation. We'll call it Seattle. <laughs> we, can, we can all come home. <clears throat> and so I, uh, this is who we are as people. And so when Justice talks about river people, exactly, because when you're out in a canoe, the easiest way to get around is through the rivers, it's through the um, canoe journey. And the village of Stuck Justice, I was mapping it out today, it's 13 miles as a crow flies from the mouth of the Duwamish. And so it's at the very end of the tidal flows. And so you could certainly see why there was a village there because you would uh, ride the tides in a canoe from clear out there in the ocean all the way up to the village of Stuck. And so I just wanted to share that with everybody and that uh, we recognize the Black River people because that was the big village. That's where all the big mucky mucks were. <laughs> and so, so thank you. My little house, that's just Herring House. So thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Ken. So as Mommy mentioned in her introduction, and I think Erica has dropped in the chat, you can go to shapeourwater.org to follow along. As I said, this is the first of three fireside series and we'll have a few other events that are related to this topic in content. So after I give Justice some space, um, there will be a slide that will pop up to sort of remind you of future dates and um, other ways to stay in touch and keep informed. So with that, I think Justice, you can close us out in whatever way you want, share what's on your mind. Um, and thank you again to all of you. You've done something I think um, I've never seen uh, and it's really important. Thank you, Giselle. And sorry, I, I think it, I phrased that wrong, but it was more of a misunderstanding on my end. And I think this worked out better than just having me talk at you guys for 10 minutes straight because I've had presentations like that. And I definitely prefer when we're in, um, you know, when we're speaking on issues like this, that it's much more in that conversation format. And so I really enjoyed that. And I was still able to work in my talking points, like to answer the questions and stuff. But yeah, ultimately, I think um, it's encouraging to have this discussion too, as you know, we look towards a 50 year plan and how we can change our relationship with water. And I also think it's uh, very important that it started off with native voices. Um, and, you know, I, um, for far too long, I feel like uh, native people haven't been given a seat at the table. And now I'm kind of in the mindset of like, you know, we don't need to be at the table, we can just do this stuff on our own. But it's still nice to be in, invited to things and, uh, um, you know, there's always a place for direct action. Um, and yeah, I, I'd love to be able to share history with people in our audience more. Um, I still have a lot to know. I'm by no means an expert uh, on our, our history, our oral tradition, or our stories. But um, yeah, I, I see a comment in the chat. We, me and my buddy Wayne, uh, through, through our work, we actually developed like a since time immemorial um, presentation that kind of supplements this uh, presentation my dad has. So, um, but anyways, yeah, thank you all for this opportunity. And um, yeah, that's all I got. You're not gonna give us like a Star Wars close out to go with the posters. Oh, I, can you guys see them? <laughs> There's, May the force be with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to the audience. You all have been great. And um, Erica and team, if we want to show up the little logistical details for people who want to tune in um, to future events. Thank you again to the team. And again, best wishes to Matt um, Rimley, who really was sort of the thought powerhouse behind tonight.